Ever since the dawn of the Macintosh, a very clear line has been drawn between the realm of Intel PCs and Apple Macintosh computers. But what if I were to tell you that the incredible Mac OS, exclusively written for Apple computers only, suddenly became obsolete, found its way off of Apple computers, and eventually wasn't even written by Apple at all? All of these were the circumstances surrounding possibly Apple's biggest failure, Project Copeland. Back in the mid-80s, Apple, learning from the failure of the Lisa, decided to make a much simpler GUI-based computer. The result was the Macintosh. While the Mac was much faster and cheaper than the Lisa, it was much more limited. One of the biggest performance boosts Apple made was replacing the system's preemptive multitasking with cooperative multitasking. The consequence, however, was that cooperative multitasking required programs to cooperate with the OS. Anytime a single program crashed, it would take down every other program with it. Now when the Mac was new, cooperative multitasking allowed the machine to run more than one program at once, quickly and responsibly, and the increased risk of crashing wasn't as big of a problem. But as computers got faster and programs got more complex, the limitations of this model began to show, and Apple could see it. In 1988, long after Steve Jobs was kicked out, the development team was called together to talk about the future of Mac OS. Based on color-coded index cards, a blue and pink team were formed. While the blue team worked on small features for the upcoming Mac OS 7, the pink team focused on improvements for the next OS after that, with the main goal being a switch to preemptive multitasking. Apple also wanted to remain competitive against other computing models, like the increasingly popular Wintel, and decided the best way to go would be by teaming up with IBM. Apple's Pink project quickly got shifted over to an IBM platform, and in 1992, development began between Apple and IBM. The project, known as Taligent, failed on many respects. First from a lack of interest by consumers, followed by fighting between the two companies. Apple eventually decided to leave the product to IBM, who finished it to poor reception. While the Pink team had been busy with Taligent, not much was happening in Apple regarding the new OS they were supposed to make. Instead, people began to work on more advanced features and improvements with the idea that they would run on top of Taligent. But since Taligent wasn't available, they built everything on the already aging Mac OS. With each addition and patch, the OS grew more bloated, unstable, and likely to crash any minute. Windows 95 at the time was gaining more attention for adopting the features Apple sought to bring to the Mac. But with nothing more than a rotting, decade-old OS, there was nothing the Mac could show. It was apparent to Apple that their new OS had to come out soon. And so, just like before, they hacked together a quick solution. The idea was that new features would be written, while other parts of the OS like QuickDraw, the graphics engine, didn't need to be rewritten. Instead, on top of the preemptive multitasking OS, there would be a memory environment called the Blue Box, where all of the older applications would run. After that OS was released, Apple would clean up the Blue Box and update all of the code. The project was codenamed Copeland, after the composer Aaron Copeland, to continue the, the pattern of the past system's codename, Mozart. Copeland could have been a good system. It wouldn't have been great, but it may have been just what was needed to get Apple back on pace with Windows 95. The big difference between how it could have been a good system rather than actually being one, though, mostly comes down to the infamous feature creep. Being the new exciting project at Apple, everyone wanted in on it, even projects that had nothing to do with it. As a result of these features being added in, the OS had to be delayed, and because of the delays, Apple began to promise more features. At such a critical time, the spiral only helped to push the release dates further into the future. With most of the OS work being done on goodies rather than a stable system, the OS couldn't be expected to run well for a tech demo. Instead, Apple opted to show off the technologies that had been developed for Copeland. They also sent out an early release for developers, but with an OS that could easily crash just sitting idle, not much could be done with it, including development. When developers complained, Apple decided to finally focus on the core OS, but in doing so, announced more features that would take time to implement. The planned release in 1996 got moved to sometime 1997. New management for the project concluded that Copeland was hopeless, and that Apple should look into just purchasing another company's OS. Of all the companies thrown around, even including Microsoft, Apple surprised everyone by buying Next, the company Steve Jobs had founded shortly after leaving Apple. With this purchase, Apple finally got back on track and began throwing in many purchased third-party upgrades into System 7.6, while System 8 was under construction. 
Systems 8 and 9 were essentially the same technology from System 7, but were designed to make the transition to the newer architecture of Next easier. In 2001, the technology was ready, and Apple released OS X. At first, the OS was a bit shaky and slow, but given a few more years, OS X received tremendous praise. Apple continued to upgrade OS X, with each version, much like System 7, being an incrementing decimal to the version number, a tradition still practiced today with OS X version 10.12. With these new versions of OS X, the underlying software remains mostly the same, even if new features are added. In fact, some of these features were at one point Copeland projects. Things in OS X, like video chatting, web browsing, and even desktop searching all have their roots in Project Copeland. Of course, while these projects eventually saw a release, Copeland never did. What started as a simple project of updating an aging OS only grew into a monstrosity that taught Apple the lesson, a stitch in time saves nine. Or perhaps in this case, a stitch in time could have saved eight.